lions and tigers and bears on the front lines of the environmental movement? Surprising as it may sound, that's very much what's happening at the Naval Zoo. Since its founding in 1969, the popular attraction has been inching ever greener in ways big and small. The pace picked up in the 21st century, prompting new exhibits and grand species-saving plans for the future. From the beginning, zoo founders Lawrence and Nancy Tetzloff followed the conservation lead of the property's original owner, Dr. Henry Neerling, a botanist who turned the grounds into a tropical garden in the 1920s. The Tetzloffs gave their alligators a large, lushly surrounded lake and situated monkeys, gibbons, and lemurs on cage-free islands in a second gatorless lagoon. I think my parents, especially my dad, were you know ahead of their time, his time, with, with the conservation ethic. He was talking about conservation stuff in the 60s. My dad understood the people-animal thing has to work together. Some of the newer green ideas at the now accredited and not-for-profit zoo are simple. An abundance of recycling containers, for instance, and the use of bicycles by the staff. It's a much healthier way for us to get around. We're not using all this electricity, charging umpteen golf carts. Other changes are more immediately noticed and enhance visitors' experience. Seven new or redesigned enclosures feature glass walls to provide unobstructed viewing. Panther Glade was the first exhibit that we used glass. We put two 8x5 panels of glass, which allows the cougars to get about an inch and a half away from you. And when we saw that the interest and the excitement that our guests had with that, we thought, well, glass is the way to go. And for every exhibit that we do from now on, glass will be an integral part of that because you, I think, get a greater appreciation for how big these animals are when you're that close. If they can tear their eyes away from the animals, guests may notice decals on the glass panels. Their purpose is to protect native wildlife that may visit the zoo. It can look like a butterfly or shape of a, a bird, and what that does, it's ultraviolet, and the bird's vision picks up on that, so they won't fly into the glass, because we're here to help the native species as well. Tetzloff and company also pay attention to Southwest Florida's unique environment, as evidenced in the Black Bear Hammock exhibit that opened in May of 2009. We use what we call our natural habitat theme, where we help tell the story of how the loggers came in here in the 40s and 50s to pretty much devastate our cypress swamp. So there's very little old growth cypress here in South Florida, and this happened right in the middle of bear and cougar habitat. And then we also have a second theme of the exhibit, and that is about backyards, because we made the whole th half of it look like a backyard. There's a bird bath and a kiddie pool and a swing and a play set, a picnic table, and we tell a story about how to safely coexist with large predators that are coming in people's backyards here in Collier County. The Leopard Rock exhibit is a good example of the zoo's commitment to making life in captivity interesting for its animals. The faux copy rock is a replica of the rocks on which leopards perch in Africa. From atop it, the leopards can see lions in one direction and gazelle and impala in another. We like to think about as we're building our animal exhibits here at the zoo, how the animal's life is gonna be once you put them in that exhibit. And those lions? They are two of only about 75 South African lions in the country and from a species that may soon become endangered. And so the zoo has enrolled them in a species survival breeding program. What these basically are is you could call them computer dating systems for animals. Genetically compatible animals are set up for perpetuation of species. And what you basically need is at least 100, sometimes more, of a given species, and that will give you genetic diversity for the next century. Malayan tigers and fusas from Madagascar are also involved in population management plans. When genetic matches are made, these animals will be bred with mates from other accredited zoos. This is a way that we're actually helping species continue on because if zoos don't take the time and trouble to do this, it's gonna be in trouble in the wild. The zoo also does its part to help control the spread of invasive species by serving as an official release site for red slider turtles. These small turtles are widely sold at pet shops, but owners often grow disenchanted when the turtles rapidly outgrow their aquariums. Since releasing them into the wild is illegal, Including the red sliders in the zoo's alligator exhibit is a positive alternative. 
Our gators are fed twice a day, every day. They're not in a big hurry to chase down a turtle. So the turtles basically can pretty much live out their lives here at the zoo. So we're doing the right thing for the environment by adopting these turtles here. Given the zoo's past as a botanical garden, it's hardly surprising that plants are as carefully tended here as the animals. But signs also educate guests about the benefits of such things as drinking shade-grown coffee. The education continues at the Backyard Habitat area, certified by the National Wildlife Federation. When you walk through our Backyard Habitat, we've got signs not only identifying the uh, plants that we put there that benefit local wildlife, but also other things that you can do. The zoo also tries to help the environment worldwide by planting a tree in the wild for every person who visits as part of a field trip or who purchases various memberships. In 2009, that amounted to 26,300 trees. Even the gift shop promotes environmental awareness by donating a portion of money from each stuffed animal purchase to groups working to preserve the wild. We recognize that the number one reason to visit a zoo is to spend time with your friends and family. Once those folks get here, our job is to help instill that one bit of messaging that they did not have before they came to the zoo. And that's an appreciation of wild animals and the wild places they live and what we can do as a race to protect that. Lions and tigers and bears may be the reason people come to the Naples Zoo, but thanks to the efforts of David Tetzloff and company, they just might leave a little greener at heart.